So the arc of my talk today will be to just mention the challenge of celiac diagnosis that you've heard about earlier as well and you know so well. Um, the diagnostic toolkit that we have available to help. A bit of genetics, uh, celiac genetics 101. And news about an exciting new test um, that is a test combination. Okay. So, as you know, all too well, gluten is a huge deal. Google searches for the word gluten have skyrocketed since 2012, shown in this chart. And a Gallup News uh, article in 2017 mentioned that 21% of Americans actively include some gluten-free food in their diet. So some of this is from FAD. Some is from non-celiac gluten sensitivity. I love that term that Dr. Sheila Crow told us this morning, the GWAGs, people without celiac disease avoiding gluten. And celiac is at the core of this, of course, the 1% of folks in America who have celiac disease. So sadly, celiac disease is tremendously underdiagnosed, as you know. Only about 17% 7, of people with celiac know they have it. So this means 83% don't. We have a long way to go. And the average time between onset of symptoms has been reported to be about 11 years, um, symptoms until diagnosis. And you all have stories that fit that model very much. So why is the diagnose, so, diagnosis so challenging? Um, this is for many reasons. The age of um, onset of symptoms varies so greatly from like almost newborn, as soon as someone goes on gluten until um, old age. We actually met someone who was 92 who'd just gotten diagnosed with celiac disease, been sick for a long time. Um, the wide range of nonspecific symptoms overlap with IBS, for example the variability between patients, and the fact that many of the symptoms are non-GI, as you know. And a good example of that is anemia can be the only, um, may, is the only um, presenting symptom in about 8% of the cases, for example. So we at LabCorp have created a, a postcard piece that our sales folks are out there giving to physicians. Um, that really focuses on non-GI, you know, think about the non-GI symptoms. And they're up here if you want to grab any to give to your own physicians. Um, we want to get that on the radar. Um, oh, and the other reason is uh, silent celiac. So many cases are actually asymptomatic. Let's see, what slide am I on? Yep, so silent celiac is a real thing. And there are no symptoms, but the antibodies and inflammation are occurring and damage to the villi. Um, so folks with silent celiac are often discovered through testing of relatives, so family members of relatives. And the celiac iceberg, I'm sure, is familiar to you all as well. The um, more people have silent celiac, actually, than symptomatic celiac. And there is another group of folks with antibodies, they're calling it latent celiac, that don't have villi damage, but um, they do have the antibodies. So what's in the celiac diagnostic toolkit? So you're all very familiar with the serology, and that's the first line of testing classically with the different antibodies. And Dr. Crow talked about them this morning, so I won't go into detail. Um, and then there's a celiac disease genetic test, which is the HLA test I'll talk about more in a minute. And of course, the small bowel um, biopsy is the gold standard for the diagnosis. Um, the ACG guidelines, um, just really briefly about the serology testing. So TTG, IgA, if a physician's going to use one antibody, that's the one that they recommend going for. And of course, doing total IgA as well is important to rule out the folks with 
um, IgA deficiency. So IgA deficiency is about one in 400-ish in the general population, but it's two to 3% of people with celiac, so it's really important to test for that. For children under age two, um, because of the development is slower of the TTG antibodies, it's good to combine that test with D, GP, IgA, and IgG. So who to test? Again, the ACG guidelines say obviously people symptomatic with malabsorption or any symptoms of celiac, first degree members of family, um, and consider asymptomatic. It actually, guidelines actually say that. Consider doing testing on the asymptomatic family members. And type one diabetes. So the, uh, the rate of celiac in uh, people with diabetes is a recent study showed up to 20% people with diabetics, so just test them all, physicians. Mm -hmm. yep. So celiac HLA genetic testing. The predisposition to celiac disease is determined by these two molecules that you're very familiar with, DQ2 and DQ8, which are essential for celiac disease to develop. Um, the testing can be done on blood or buccal cells, equally accurate. And um, the DNA test results are always positive in individuals who have celiac. The negative result essentially excludes celiac disease. So that's the power of the test. It really helps the doctor go down the right pathway. And it's a once in a lifetime test. Um, so if there's an issue with the expense, it is not going to be needed ever again. And the genes, the HLA, Immune genes, or many of them, are clustered on this chromosome 6. And our one of interest is HLA-DQ, which is down near the bottom. And for the mechanism, so how does this create, um, having these HLA alleles, how does that create celiac disease, the pathology of it? And what happens is the HLA-DQ or DQ8 molecule is actually a double one with two arms, an alpha and they're sitting on immune cells, and they reach up, I think of it as an analogy with a beach ball. So if gliadin is a beach ball, these arms reach up, and they can catch it. And when that occurs, then it starts the whole cascade and the immune, the T cell activation, and everything downstream, including making the antibodies. If there's half an arm, so half DQ2 can lead to celiac disease. Um, those folks can't catch the ball quite as well with half an arm. Um, so the risk is a little lower to get celiac, but they can get celiac. And if you don't have DQ2 or DQ8, the ball just bounces on your head and goes away. <laughs> um, it can't, you don't, your body doesn't see it, so that's why you can't get celiac if you don't have those um, molecules. So without getting into the weeds, I'll just show you what the actual variants are that we're looking at in the lab. And just know that there are thousands of HLA variants, and these are very specific ones just for celiac. So that's what we're reporting on. Okay, and this is very much in the weeds, but it leads to an answer that I get um, a lot of questions about, is how is this inherited? So DQ2 can um, occur in a person two different ways. The alpha and the beta gene, they can be on separate chromosomes, on the left, and, uh, oh no, sorry, on the left is in there, when they're on the same chromosome, it's called in cis. Cis means in Latin, the same. So they're on the same chromosome, so a person can inherit the whole chunk all at once. Or they can be on opposite chromosomes in trans, and in that case, I'll show you in the diagram, it's inherited differently. DQ8 is more simple, it's always just the one part, the 0302 part is important, so it's just on one chromosome. And here's the diagram, and if anyone wants, there's a um, big review article that I published in Gene Reviews, and I've got these diagrams, so if anybody wants them to take home, um, it's a good visual. So, um, yep, on the left shows the one scenario in trans. So in this case, the mom, the little person with the skirt, um, has the DQ alpha and the DQ beta variants on separate chromosomes. So she's going to be giving all of her children half of DQ2. See how that works? They can't, they, they're all gonna have at least half DQ2. Then the scenario on the right is this one, the dad has the whole DQ2 on one, it's in cis, on one chromosome. So for him, it'll be the 50% risk to give that to his kids, and 50% of them will not get the DQ2. 
So that's why the answer to the question is, how is it inherited? Can it be from just one parent? Or um, it, people think it's like cystic fibrosis, that it might be autosomal recessive, and it's a little different. See, it can be either from one parent or it can be from both parents. Okay. So moving on, just some basic facts. 90% of people with celiac have DQ2. That's the big daddy one. 5 to 10% have DQ8. The remainder, um, almost all the remainder have half DQ2. And you need those to get celiac. And in the population, as Dr. Crow mentioned too, um, these are common. So am I on the right slide? Yep. Um, 30 to 40% of the Caucasian population have either DQ2 or DQ8 or both. And so in general, about 3% of those folks develop celiac. But if they have relatives with celiac, then the risk can go up as high as 40%, depending on how many relatives they have. So it goes up quite a bit from 3%. Um, here's a risk chart that's been developed. So depending on what the result is for the genetic test, you can see what your genetic risk is, and that's only the genetic. If you've got a bunch of symptoms and relatives, your risk is going to be higher than the genetic risk. But as you see, DQ2 plus DQ8, you can have them both. And someone I heard of was really proud that he had both. He said, I've got super, super celiac. <laughs> um, that risk is 1 in 7, and then just DQ2 alone is about 1 in 35. And I'll show you, this shows uh, the lab cores. We in put this embedded into the report at LabCorp. So there's a nice visual that shows a bar and the amount of risk with an arrow showing the risk, and there's different colors. So it's really easy for a physician to see. And then on the page two, there's that risk table. So how can the genotyping help? The negative result? excludes the diagnosis of celiac. That's the big power. Positive results indicate the individual is predisposed. So for the rest of their lives, they could develop celiac. So checking them for antibodies is not a bad idea. Um, who should have the genetic test? Obviously, patients on a gluten-free diet. It's the only test that will be helpful for them. And it, it is helpful. Um, and. Um, when the diagnostic testing is unclear for the serology or for the biopsy, or the two don't make sense together, great, to sort it out with the genetic test. And testing family members at risk, that's a really big one. Certain celiac centers um, do that. I think uh, Peter Green does just on families, and we offer that at Kimball a lot. So it's helpful to sort out who's at risk. And you may find folks who have celi uh, silent celiac that way. So you find they're genetically positive, and then you can go ahead and check their antibodies. And it's like, oh, they've got silent celiac. They didn't know it. They can benefit from a gluten-free diet um, because that's thought to reduce their risk of getting the secondary autoimmune diseases. That's important. So it's hard for them because they don't feel bad. Um, they haven't got the symptoms, but it's still better to have the gluten-free diet. And this helps, the genetic test helps establish a strategy for the antibody testing. The patient's positive. Um, sorry, if the patient, yeah, if the patient is positive for the genetics, then go ahead and do the antibodies, and it's suggested like every um, three to five years. Okay, and I've mentioned about the family, so this one talks about how it's helpful for family members. And then I want to get on before I get cut off, because I bet it's close to 10 minutes. Yes. Um, <laughs> this is almost the last slide. So the exciting news is there's a new all-in-one test that's available. Um, we launched that at LabCorp in 2017. And um, the concept behind that is for one order, you have a blood and a serum sample. And it starts, so it's turning the paradigm of diagnosis on its head. Um, and there's actually an article that's called that. Um, start with a genetic test and sort out who's negative. The negative folks don't need the antibody test. And then the ones that are positive go on, yeah, go on um, to the serology, and then you figure out there. So if you could find someone um, with silent celiac that way as well. The only caveat is for the reflex to work, the person needs to be on gluten currently or in the fairly distant, I mean, near past 
Um, if the antibodies are positive, though, it really tells you something, even if they've been off gluten for a little while. So that's the new one, and I've got brochures if you're interested in uh, seeing a brochure about that. And then just wanted to close by saying genetic counseling, a plug for genetic counseling is really useful for families to explain the results and to talk about family members and who might benefit from uh, testing. And, and lastly, I just wanted to give a plug for the CDF has developed this wonderful tool for physicians um, that is a web-based tool to help with diagnosis. They did that in collaboration with Nespagan. And so now that this can help physicians, um, you can put in the symptoms and say, oh, should I get testing and which type of testing? So many thanks. And any questions I get, they'll be after.